we shall continue with the topic of uh, chromatography. We were talking about uh, the ion exchange chromatography that is the uh, chromatography used when uh, you want to separate ionic uh, metabolites or ionic proteins. It could be an anionic or it could be cationic or it could be both together. So, what happens in an ion exchange chromatography? We have an inert support nowadays we they use more of a polymeric based support. Uh, you have ions see in this particular example we are showing positive ions all anchored on to the inert support. Now, suppose you are introducing a mixture of cations and anions what will happen? The negative ions will bound to the positive ions. So, the exhaust stream will have only positive ions coming out. Once you have done the separation but you can change the buffer conditions like you can change the salt concentration or you can change the pH. So, that whatever negative ions that are bound will come out. So, this is one way of separating positive and negative ions. Suppose you have both cations and anions anchored to the support then we can remove the entire salt from a mixture. For example, I am using a salt for salting out of a protein such a solution will have protein and salts and ion exchange chromatography containing both cations and anions could be one way of removing the salts first and then you can go into purifying the protein of interest. So, ion exchange chromatography is based on the concept of uh, the ions separation of ions either it could be ions of interest which could be concentrated or ions of not interest could be captured. So, both can be adopted. So, the stationary phase will have ligands of certain charge. Okay. So, the biomolecules in the mixture of opposite charge will preferentially attach to it and proteins or molecules with the same charge will be eluting out even uncharged proteins will be eluting out first. Now, you can have two types of ion exchange chromatography that means cation as well as anion or you can have mixtures of both cation and anionic uh, ligands present inside the chromatography. So, for example, if you are looking at an anion exchanger the functional groups used could be amino ethyl or quaternary ammonium. So, there will be a plus charge on the nitrogen. Okay. For cation exchangers we can have functional groups like carboxy methyl, sulfopropyl, methyl sulfonate and so on actually. Okay. Sulfonic and quaternary ammonium groups form strong while other groups form weak ion exchangers. So, if you are varying the ionization as a function of pH it determines the strength of the ion exchanger it does not tell you anything about the strength of the binding of the protein and the ligand. Okay. It just tells about the strength of the ion exchanger system. So, the interaction between protein and the ion exchanger depends on the net charge. So, higher is the charge higher will be the binding capacity charge distribution on the protein surface okay, how the positive and negative charges are distributed on the protein surface, ionic strength, pH of the solvent, nature of ions that are present and presence of other additives that are present inside. Higher the charge on the protein more strongly it will bind to a given ion exchanger of opposite charge obvious right. Also the pH of the solvent determines the protein binding it also determines the effective charge on the protein and an exchanger. So, if the protein has very high charge it will bind strongly to the ion exchanger system and if the pH of the solvent is different then the protein binding capacity also becomes different. So, what does an ion exchanger contain? It consists of a matrix that is an insoluble matrix that will be the base on which the ionic ligands are immobilized through a covalent bond. Okay. The charge groups could be acidic or the charge groups could be basic functional groups. So, you can have four types of matrices you can have synthetic hydrophobic polymeric resins like polystyrene, polystyrene is pretty hydrophobic natural or synthetic hydrophilic polymers. So, when you say natural it could be cellulose, dextran, agarose and so on. 
it could be synthetic hydrophilic polymers made into hard beads like they use in HPLC systems. So, what is the advantage? We can use rigorous methods for washing and cleaning, recycling, reusing. So, that is an ad advantage or we can use silica gel based method. So, we can have different types of matrices in an ex ion exchange uh, column. So, your typical ion exchangers if you have a cationic exchanger I could use carboxymethyl, we can use orthophosphate, we can use sulfonate, we can use sulfoethyl, sulfopropyl and so on. So, each one has different pK values ok as you can see here. So, depending upon the type of ions you would like to separate then uh, we can use different types of cationic uh, ligands anchored to the stationary phase. Suppose we are looking at anionic we can use diethyl aminoethyl, trimethyl hydroxypropyl, quaternary aminoethyl, triethyl aminoethyl, polyethylene amine. So, you see a lot of nitrogen containing groups are here in most of this ok. So, that is how you get the charge n plus charge ok. Whereas, in the previous case we have a lot of uh, OH type of groups which gives you a um, negative charge. Again if you look at the p k values they are more in the basic side whereas, in the other case they are more in the acidic side. So, what determines the capacity of an ion exchanger? Capacity is the quantitative measure of the ability of the ion exchanger system to take in the counter ions. So, it depends on the number of charged functional groups present inside the column per gram of dry ion exchanger per ml of swollen gel. So, how do you determine it? We can titrate it with strong acid or base and then we can find out how much of the acid or base required to um, neutralize the ion exchange system ok. So, you can have say like 100 to 500 micromolar per ml of beads, beads you know beads of bed. So, that is a very high degree of ionic capacity. So, the total capacity of an ion exchanger for binding protein can be expressed in terms of serum albumin for anion or lysozyme or hemoglobin for cation exchangers. So, uh, generally the capacity um, is based on if it is an uh, anion the amount of serum albumin that can be exchanged if it is an cation the amount of lysozyme or hemoglobin that can be exchanged. So, the properties of ion exchange will depend on porosity as well because highly porous material we can have more uh, charged ligands bound to it. Type of charge functional groups present on the stationary matrix, number of charge functional groups present on the stationary matrix. So, all these properties decide on the ion exchange matrix. So, how do you get high capacity in an ion exchanger matrix? We can have highly macroporous matrix, we can substitute it with ionic groups which maintain their charge even over a wide range of pH that is also very important. So, greater the pore size of an exchanger greater will be the dynamic capacity for a given protein. For example, if you take DEAE Cephadex A50 which has large pores binds about 250 milligrams of hemoglobin per ml of bed that is a big number 250 milligrams of hemoglobin per ml of bed. Whereas, if we have we are A25 with smaller pore it binds only 70 milligrams of uh, hemoglobin per ml. So, we can achieve 250 milligrams of hemoglobin per ml or we can achieve 70 milligrams of hemoglobin per ml depending upon the pore distribution and pore size. Non porous matrix will have lower capacity than porous matrix that is obvious, but non porous matrix will have higher efficiency because the molecules do not have to diffuse through the pore. So, the pore diffusion is 0. So, it, it is having less diffusion distances. So, capacity will be higher. For a cation exchanger the buffering ion should be negatively charged ok. 
like phosphate, carbonate, acetate or morpholine sulfonate when the counter ions is ammonium, sodium or potassium. So, ammonium acetate is used for cation exchangers because it has the advan additional advantage of volatility and whereas, for an anion exchanger the buffering ion should be positively charged like tris buffer with chloride as the counter ion. So, if you have a cation exchanger the buffering ion should be negatively charged, if you have an anion exchanger the buffering ion should be positively charged. So, for a cation exchanger the buffering ion could be phosphate, carbonate, acetate, morpholine, sulphate when the counter ions are ammonium, sodium or potassium correct. Whereas, if it is an anion exchanger we could use tris buffer with chloride as the counter ion because for an anion exchanger we need a positively charged buffering ion. So, how do you go about preparing the sample for an ion exchanger we need to prepare the sample. So, the amount of sample should be less than 20 percent of dynamic capacity of the bed and sample volume should be less than 5 percent of the bed volume. So, we do not want to uh, overload the uh, bed then it becomes very very inefficient. It, the sample should be free from suspended particles or turbidity because we do not want uh, turbid material um, binding to the ions. Viscosity of the element and the sample should be similar. If the element and that is the continuous phase and the sample are different then uh, you are going to have problems with the flow. So, in case of nucleic acid samples viscosity may be reduced by digestion with the endonuclease. Syringe introduction of sample is always recommended. Column should be washed with the starting buffer till no free or unbound components are present in the column. So, we have to keep washing, washing, washing until whatever is bound gets totally removed and the column is free from any ions bound to the ion exchanger. So, even after each analysis or after each uh, separation we need to wash the column thoroughly using a buffer solution. So, variety of elution techniques can be used, we can use an isocratic elution that means we use a single solvent, single strength continuously flowing throughout the separation process. We can use stepwise solution that means, we can slowly change the strength of the salt in terms of steps. We can have a gradient elution by changing the pH or ionic strength or both that means, we can slowly linearly change the pH over a period of time. We can have affinity elution that means, we can add certain affinity, affinity ligands. We can have displacement chromatography that means, we can have another yes, buffer solution which will displace whatever has been bound to the ion exchange column. So, we can think of different elution techniques for separation as well as for later uh, activation of the column as well as uh, removal of ions which are bound to the stationary phase. So, the column regeneration is a very very important aspect after you have done the ion exchange separation process. Like I mentioned that uh, you need to keep on washing with buffer until whatever is bound gets removed. So, like a salt solution ok. So, we can introduce salt solution until the ionic strength reaches about 2 molar to wash out whatever has been bound to the ion exchange stationary matrix. So, the salt solution should contain counter ions to the ion exchanger to facilitate equilibration that is very very important actually ok. So, there should be some counter ions which will remove the ions that are bound to the ion exchange matrix. Sometimes denatured proteins or lipids may remain in the column even after regeneration ok. There may be some tightly bound impurities. So, what do we do? Then we have to rem removal of tightly bound impurities or denatured proteins by washing the column with 0.5 to 1 molar sodium hydroxide solution. No? So, we have to resort to very uh, harsh conditions like using sodium hydroxide 
ok. So, it will remove all the contaminants number one, number two it will also inactivate if there are any microbes present. So, that way we are something like a, a sterilizing our system. So, that the microbes do not grow and form biofilm inside your ion exchange system. So, what are the column material or the stationary phase we need to consider? The column material should be inert, the bed support should facilitate free flow of liquid with minimum clogging ok. That is very very important if you are going to have a clogging you are going to create pressure inside the column and you are creating a back pressure. So, the pump which is uh, pumping the solution inside is going to have problem and the column material should be easily replaceable um, uh, and then we so that we can charge with fresh material inside. It should withstand back pressure developed when high performance medium is used that means, it should not crumble when we apply very high pressures. The dead space inside the column after you have packed should also be minimum ok, because if you have dead space we are going to have improper mixing. So, we will have zones of good mixing and good separation, you will have zones of uh, improper mixing and bad separations. So, the uniformity of separation is going to be very very poor. So, there should not be any dead space inside your packed column. So, these are certain requirements for the column material and hence we need to design column materials, uh, so that all these conditions are satisfied. The column length should be 5 times the diameter of the column ok. Short column is preferred for gradient illusion while long column is preferred for isocratic illusion. So, if you are thinking about uh, only isocratic that means, using only one solvent of certain strength throughout the um, chromatographic process then it is better to have very long column actually. So, generally if you look at laboratory column they will have a packed height varying between 5 to 15 centimeters, 15 centimeters is almost half a foot. So, it is not very very long actually and the amount of ion exchanger should be 10 to 20 percent of its dynamic capacity ok. Ion exchange systems are used quite a lot in hard water uh, purification especially for uh, purification of well water or river water which contains too much hardness. Hardness is caused by the presence of calcium and magnesium ions. So, it forms insoluble precipitate just like soap actually. So, we can soften the water, we can soften the well or deep bore well water using an ion exchange system. We can use uh, sodium ions, so that the calcium and magnesium are replaced with sodium ions. So, ion exchange systems are the best if you want to soften water. The column must be regenerated of course, um, by passing concentrated solution of sodium chloride. So, we cannot keep on using the same column for processing large amount of hard water after some time the calcium and magnesium uh, ions will uh, uh, completely saturate the ion exchanger. So, we need to pass sodium chloride. So, what will happen excess sodium ions will displace this calcium and magnesium ions that are bound to the stationary matrix. So, originally these type of uh, uh, stationary phases were made up of natural aluminum silicates, but then uh, uh, long term stability of these uh, inorganic material were not as good as synthetic polymeric resins, because synthetic polymeric resins can survive much uh, uh, harsher conditions, can survive much longer duration of operation and also several cycles of uh, operations. Now, having talked about ion exchange let us move to the next uh, type of possible uh, separation that is based on the differences in the hydrophobicity. So, proteins have hydrophobic and hydrophilic groups present on the top. So, sometimes uh, the hydrophobic groups uh, may be embedded inside then such groups will not be able to contribute in the separation process, but sometimes these hydrophobic groups may be present outside because of uh, uh, the folding of the protein. So, generally hydrophobic groups are inside because proteins are always um, 
present in aqueous environment which is hydrophilic. So, hydrophobic groups are always present inside, but at some time because of the folding constraints these hydrophobic groups are present outside. So, proteins may have different patches of hydrophobicity and uh, this particular property is made use of in the area of hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So, how does it happen in this particular uh, chromatography? We have the matrix with hydrophobic groups. So, suppose you have a mixture of proteins with hydrophobic and hydrophilic nature, then what will happen? All the hydrophobic proteins will bind to the hydrophobic matrix, the hydrophilic uh, proteins will be eluted out first. Later on, we can change the buffer or we can add a detergent uh, or we can add a salt or we can add solvent and so on. So, that whatever is bound the hydrophobic proteins bound gets released and they come out. So, initially we will have predominantly hydrophilic proteins and later on during the regeneration we will have hydrophobic proteins. So, this is a good way of separating the, these two type of proteins. So, this is based on the hydrophobic nature of the on the surface of the protein. So, more hydrophobic it is more bound it is going to be less hydrophobic it is relatively it is going to come out first. So, all proteins will have hydrophobic groups, but the problem is uh, mostly these hydrophobic groups are embedded inside. So, it is like the hydrophobic amino acids that is those with non polar R groups like allylene, phyllyl allylene, valine, tryptophan, leucine, isoleucine, methionine and so on. Even phenyl groups hydrocarbon chains they all contribute towards the hydrophobic interaction part of it actually. So, a lot of these groups lead to the hydrophobic nature of the protein. So, generally as I said in an aqueous environment these are buried inside the protein, but sometimes non polar amino acids are located outside due to the folding constraints. Okay. So, if you have proteins of different hydrophobic surfaces then you can separate out using this hydrophobic interaction chromatography. Okay. So, what does the process involve? It involves loading a protein mixture suspended in a high salt solution onto a matrix containing hydrophobic matrix, eluting the protein by decreasing the salt in the solution. Okay. So, what are you doing? You are reducing the salt. So, the protein will go more into the solution okay, and they get bound to the surfaces depending upon the extent of hydrophobicity. Later on we will change the polarity of the phase by adding non ionic detergents or organic solvents during the process whatever hydrophobic proteins that have been um, attached to the hydrophobic matrix matrices will get released. So, these are the various steps in the entire process of uh, hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So, it can be used in the early stages of the separation processes especially when the protein is precipitated in the presence of salts okay. and also it uses high salt concentration you are using very high salt concentration. So, this method is ideal if the previous method also uses salt. So, you do not have to remove the salt um, as a step 1 and then go for some other chromatography because some chromatographies will be hindered if the salts are present whereas, HIC uh, will work only in high salt concentration. So, this is a very good technique and HIC ion exchange chromatography, gel filtration chromatography that is GPC they are useful to remove protein without affecting its activity. So, when I use HIC I am not affecting the activity of the protein. If I use ion exchange chromatography I will not be affecting the activity of protein. If I again use gel filtration or gel permeation chromatography I am not affecting the activity of the protein whereas, some techniques may affect the activity of my protein. So, HIC is ideal for such situations. Okay. So, what are the important parameters we need to consider when we are using HIC type of separation? Type of ligand 
okay. what type of uh, hydrophobic groups am I using on top of my stationary matrix. What is the percentage coverage of these ligand on the matrix, composition of the matrix support, what is the type of salt used in the buffer, concentration of the salt, what is the pH, what is the temperature, what are the additives used in the buffer, are you using any, any other chemicals to change um, certain surface properties or are you using some chemicals to change dielectric constant of the solvent and so on actually. So, these are the parameters which is going to affect the performance of the HIC. So, we can play around with these parameters, so that I am able to get a good separation uh, in a mixture of proteins based on HIC. So, what are the type of ligands that are immobilized on the stationary phase? Okay. So, because that determines the selectivity quite a lot. We can think about groups like alkyl groups of different chain lengths, because alkyls are hydrophobic. So, we can have different chain lengths alkyl and thereby I increase the hydrophobic nature of the groups or I can use aryl groups like phenyl groups, they are also hydrophobic in nature actually. Okay. So, I can have surfaces um, with the different alkyl chain length attached which makes the surface hydrophobic in nature. So, if I have very long chain hydrocarbon, then the binding capacity will be much higher when compared to short chain hydrocarbons. So, the ligands that are immobilized are generally um, hydrocarbon chain lengths or aryl type of groups. Common matrices used in uh, hydrophobic interaction chromatography are about 4 to 6 percent cross link agarose, but they are strong hydrophilic carbohydrates. Okay. Smaller particle size will lead to higher resolution, so like 34 micron particles will lead to very high resolution, but you need to consider that the pressure drop in the column will be inversely proportional to the square of the particle size that is pressure drop is proportional to 1 by particle size square. So, smaller the particle higher will be the pressure drop and it is going to go up in terms of square. So, if the particle size goes down pressure drop increases, the pressure drop increases, back pressure increases that means I need to have much more stronger pump to pump the solution through the column. So, that is a big problem. So, you need to consider this aspect and you cannot keep on reducing the particle size of the support. Addition of salts lead to salting out, we talked about salting out long time back. So, more salts you have in the solution protein will start coming out and it will increase the interaction between the protein and the ligand. Okay. So, the idea is to increase the interaction between the protein and ligand. So, what do you do? You can add lot of salt. If the concentration of salt is increased, the amount of protein bound to the immobilized ligand also increases, it is obvious. When I am adding more salt, I am enhancing salting out, so the proteins are going to precipitate out. Now, these proteins will interact more strongly with the ligand. So, salt promotes interaction, whereas some salts promote elution of the protein from the matrix. That means, some salts can also help in the uh, displacement of the protein bound to the matrix. So, there is something called Hofmeister series, which describes the effect of anions and cations on protein precipitation. Okay. So, if you move from this end, right hand end, right going to the left hand end, we are increasing salting out effect this is also called structure forming. So, if I am moving from SCN minus to I minus, ClO4 minus, NO3 minus, Br minus, Cl minus, CH3CO minus, SO4 2 minus, PO4 3 minus, I am enhancing the salting out. Okay. Whereas, conversely, if I am moving from this end to this end, 
I am increasing the salting in effect that is called catotrophic. So, if I am moving from ammonium 4 plus to Rb plus K plus Na plus Cs plus Li plus Mg2 plus Ca2 plus barium 2 plus I am increasing the salting in effect that means protein will dissolve more inside the solution. So, if I am moving from here to here that is from the right to the left I am in enhancing the solubility of the protein or sorry I am enhancing the salting out effect that is protein will be coming out whereas, if I am moving in from this left hand end to the right hand end I am enhancing the salting in effect. So, this type of movement will enhance the interaction between the protein and the immobilized material whereas, when I am moving from this end to this end I am increasing the solubility of the protein inside the solvent. So, I am decreasing the interaction between the protein and the immobilized uh, um, hydrophobic group. So, you can play around with the, the type of anions or with the type of cations either to um, enhance the interaction between the protein and the ligand which is immobilized through hydrophobic interactions or I can reduce the interaction between the protein and the ligand. So, changing pH also improves interaction between ligand and matrix. So, we can play around with pH so that we can enhance the interaction. For example, a ligand that do not bind to a hydrophobic interaction stationary phase at neutral pH may bind at acidic pH to it. Okay. So, I can make it slightly more acidic so that I can make the, the protein bind to the stationary phase whereas, it might not be binding at the neutral pH. Okay, once you have bound this protein the next step will be regenerating the column and recovering this bound protein right that is called desorption recovery collection of whatever has been bound to the matrix. So, what do we do? We decrease the concentration of salt. So, when we decrease the concentration of the salt what happen? There is something called salting in that may be happening. So, the protein that is bound to the hydrophobic uh, matrix will go into solution in the solvent. Originally we had very high concentration of salt. So, we had a salting out like effect. Now, we will have lower concentration of salt. So, we will be having something called a salting in type of effect. We can add an organic solvent. So, what are you doing? We are changing dielectric constant of the elution buffer. So, we can add an organic solvent, we are changing the dielectric constant. So, the protein that is bound will get unbound. We can also add neutral detergent that means, detergent is nothing but surfactant. So, by doing this we are trying to solubilize the protein that is bound to the surface. So, these are some techniques by which we can recover the protein that is bound to the immobilized surface when we perform an hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So, at the same time you are regenerating your column for further studies. Okay. So, different ways one is changing the concentration of salt, second is by adding an organic solvent changing the dielectric constant or adding some detergent neutral detergent. We do not want to add a cationic or anionic type of detergent because that is again going to contribute in the form of a uh, changing the concentration, but we want to add a neutral detergent. So, decreasing the concentration of the salt we can do it in a linear or stepwise manner. So, we have a very high concentration of salt. So, we can slowly decrease in a very linear fashion over a period of time or we can decrease it in steps 2 3 steps the concentration is brought down. So, in a continuous gradient salt concentration is decreased linearly or continuously in step gradient one or more salt solutions of discrete concentration are passed through the column. Stepwise elution is preferred for large scale operation because doing a very uniform reduction in salt concentration over a period of long time might not be possible whereas, we can go down in steps which is much simpler easy to perform we can even reproduce it after one hour 
I reduce the salt from some value to half the value. Then after another half one hour I may be reducing the salt concentration from that to uh, lower value and so on. So, we can do this type of um, strategy for the recovery of the bound protein. Water as an eluent also has been uh, tested that also helps in uh, desorption of the protein that is bound. So, adding low concentrations of uh, water miscible alcohols, detergents, uh, salts like catatropic salts that decrease precipitation of hydrophobic compounds weakens the protein ligand interaction. So, this is another way first way method we looked at is changing the salt concentration, but here we are talking about adding some solvents like alcohols, detergents that is surfactants or even salting in salts and so on actually. Now, all these when you do you are desorbing the protein that is bound to the matrix. So, this these techniques help you to regenerate your column as well as recover whatever has been bound to the column. Now, if you look at a normal interaction chromatography, so you have a polar stationary phase, okay. so you have your protein there are polar groups here, so there is an interaction between the polar group of the protein and the polar stationary phase. So, you will be using a non polar solvent here. So, hydrophobic proteins will come out first because there is no interaction between the hydrophobic proteins and the polar stationary phase for example, like silica or something. And the polar proteins because they are going to interact with the polar stationary phase will get retarded and they will come in the end. Whereas, if you have non polar stationary phase like hydrophobic stationary phases and you use a polar solvent what will happen hydrophobic proteins will interact more with the non polar stationary phase whereas, hydrophilic proteins will not interact they will be coming out first and the hydrophobic proteins will be retarded they will get slowed down they will come slowly later. So, in a interaction chromatography where you have a polar surface and a non polar solvent the hydrophobic proteins will come out first, the polar groups and polar proteins will come out later. Whereas, if you take a hydrophobic type of uh, interaction system or a reverse phase chromatography, you will be having a non polar stationary phase, you will be using a polar solvent. So, the hydrophilic proteins will come out first because it is not going to interact with the stationary phase, whereas the hydrophobic proteins will come out in the end because they will be interacting with the stationary phase. So, two types of approaches we can use a polar stationary phase and a non polar solvent or we can use a non polar stationary phase and a polar solvent. So, both can be used depending upon what you want to recover, what you want to separate, what does the mixture contain, what is the concentration of the protein of your interest um, cost factors, time factors so on actually. You know. So, this uh, hydrophobic system can be also called reverse phase chromatography because in a normal phase we use a polar stationary phase whereas, in a reverse phase we are using a non polar stationary phase like a hydrocarbon like a aryl group long chain hydrocarbon. So, even in high performance liquid chromatography we use a, a hydrophobic stationary phase or a reverse phase. So, this interaction chromatography we have a polar stationary phase such as silica gel and non polar solvents such as hexane. So, there is an interaction between the polar functional groups in the protein and the polar groups on the stationary phase like NH, OH and so on. So, low polar substances are eluted first and then followed by increasing polarity. So, whereas, in the reverse phase or hydrophobic system the stationary phase is a non polar and the elution is done through a polar solvent. So, polar solvents will elute out first, non polar components will elute out at the end. So, the elution sequence for reverse phase will be carboxylic acids, amines, sulfones, sulfoxides, alcohols, amines, esters, 
aldehydes, ketones, nitro compounds, ethers, sulfides, aromatics, organic halogens, olefins and finally alkanes. So, for a reverse phase alkanes will come out in the end because there is going to be an interaction of alkane with the non-polar functional groups present on the stationary phase whereas the carboxyl carboxylic acids which are polar in nature will not interact and they will come out very fast. Okay. Sometimes surfactants are also used in the mobile phase in liquid chromatography because they are very good in solubilizing hydrophobic compounds they can help in partitioning many solutes into micelles, they are very low cost, they can also change the polarity of the mobile phase okay, depending upon the type of surfactants we use. So, that is why surfactants are also used in liquid chromatography systems and they have quite a good advantage. So, what are the critical parameters we need to consider in reverse phase? The column length, how long you want to have the column, flow rate, flow rate of your continuous phase what is the temperature you are working at, what are the solvents you are using because I said you generally require a polar solvent because you are using a non-polar or hydrophobic stationary phase. Ion suppression, how are you preventing the suppression of ionization because once you have ionization then the hydrophobic interactions will not take place, ionization spoils this type of uh, um, hydrophobic interaction. So, what do you do? we need to change the pH so that ion suppression is taking place. That means, there is no dissociation of the compound into ionizable species. Use of ion pairing agent. So, all these parameters can help us to manipulate uh, the process or the efficiency or the selectivity of the reverse phase uh, chromatography. Higher molecular weight biomolecules can be purified on short column, increasing column length improves the resolution only marginally. Whereas, if you have small peptides improve increasing column length improves the resolution. Resolution of large biomolecules is insensitive to flow rate and flow rates with long columns may decrease resolution due to increased longitudinal distance. So, they have to travel a longer distance in a long column, so the resolution gets decreased. So, in a hydrophobic uh, uh, or the reverse phase system the higher molecular rate purif biomolecules can be purified in short columns increasing the column length is not going to improve your resolution whereas, if it is small peptides yes we can improve the separation with longer columns. And resolution of larger biomolecules is also insensitive, insensitive to flow rates. Okay. And flow rates with long columns will decrease resolution due to increased longitudinal uh, distance as they travel long, longer distance. So, for low molecular weight solutes, temperature has a bigger effect because if I increase column temperature, I am affecting the viscosity of the mobile phase when I affect the viscosity of the mobile phase, um, I am affecting the diffusions, I am affecting the dispersions, I am affecting the flow patterns. So, that will have a bigger effect because mass transport of solute from the mobile to the stationary phase is a diffusion control process. So, when I am affecting uh, the viscosity, it is going to affect my diffusion coefficient. So, decreasing solvent viscosity will improve mass transfer coefficient leading to a better resolution or higher resolution. Now, we talked about uh, the hydrophobic interaction chromatography, we also mentioned about the concept of reverse phase chromatography, originally before that we talked about ion chromatography. Now, let us move to the next type of chromatography this is called gel permeation chromatography or size exclusion chromatography. So, it is based on size or it is based on molecular weight assuming higher molecular weight are bigger in size for proteins higher molecular weight are bigger in size smaller molecular weight are smaller in size. Okay. So, what do you do here we have stationary phase with pores. So, small molecules 
which are smaller than the pores will diffuse inside the pores get entrapped and get slowed down whereas, large molecules which cannot enter the pores will keep traveling. So, they will rapidly come out on the other side they will exit faster. So, large molecules will come out faster small molecules will take much longer time to come out. So, the elution time is inversely proportional to the size of the molecules or molecular weight of the molecule. So, it is a very good technique to separate molecules of different sizes or molecules of different molecular weights and it is called size exclusion chromatography or gel permeation chromatography. So, what happens? We have porous matrix inside, we have big proteins, small proteins or proteins with higher molecular weight or proteins with smaller molecular weight. So, as they travel the smaller proteins get entrapped in the porous material. So, larger proteins will just come out and after some time all the larger proteins have been removed and the smaller proteins will come later. So, the elution time is inversely proportional to the molecular weight or size of the proteins. So, the small molecules get entrapped in the porous large molecules cannot enter the pores they so they travel faster that is the principle of gel permeation chromatography or molecular sieve type of uh, chromatography. Okay. So, typically if you are looking at a elution volume or elution time you may have a 660,000 molecular weight material coming out first followed by 400,000 molecular weight material followed by 150,000 molecular weight material 55,000 molecular material 40,000 finally, 10,000. So, you can see that uh, a molecular weight from 660,000 to 10,000 could be nicely separated out using this uh, gel permeation chromatography um, or size exclusion chromatography. So, it is extremely useful um, for separating out proteins we can even measure um, the molecular weight of an unknown protein if we know molecular weight of certain proteins. So, we can use it as a analytical tool we can use it as a separating tool as well. So, it can be used both in analytical chemistry as well as in um, purification area. So, the stationary matrix for lipid is made up of copolymers of styrene and divinyl benzene. So, it will have pore sizes in the range of 50 to 500 angstroms. So, it will be of spherical particles of 5 to 10 micron in diameter. The mobile phase can be tetrahydrofuron, dichloromethane, toluene. So, if you are talking about lipoproteins, biomolecules and so on we can even use aqueous mobile phases. So, this gel permeation chromatography can be used for proteins, biomolecules, it can be used for small molecules, it can be used for uh, uh, synthetic polymers, natural polymers and so on. As I said it can be used for both purification as well as for analysis. Suppose, I have a protein of unknown molecular weight and if I have a few proteins of known molecular weight I can get a standard graph between uh, the elution time of the known proteins vis a vis their molecular weight and uh, if I get the elution time for the unknown protein from the original standard graph I can calculate what will be the molecular weight of the unknown protein. So, it is quite a powerful technique in the area of uh, analytical chemistry and it can also be used for purification based on the size or purification based on the molecular weight. What are the types of detectors we can use? We can use discometer type of detector, we can use low angle laser light scattering detector, we can use refractive index detector RI detector, we can use UV detector visible range we can use fluorescent detector, we can use differential refrometry coupled with UV detection. So, large number of detectors can be used depending upon the characteristics uh, of the protein or metabolites or small molecule or synthetic polymers or natural polymers you are trying to separate out. So, the supports are also similar to the supports that are used in ion exchange chromatography 
and we can synthesize them with varying pore size because this technique is totally based on pore size. Smaller pores will allow small molecules to get entrapped, larger pore will allow only large molecules to get entrapped. So, if I have small pores, small larger molecules will not be able to enter. So, it is based on the concept of size. So, we can synthesize pores of different sizes. Okay. So, the pore size is also a function of the density of the polymer and also the degree of cross linking. Okay. So, I can uh, manipulate the degree of cross linking, I can manipulate the density and achieve different pore sizes. So, we can even separate molecules as small as mono, di, trisaccharides that is 100 to 500 Daltons also can be separated going right up to mega Dalton okay, like 10 power 6, 10 power 7 Dalton molecular weight. So, this technique is very powerful um, for separating out from a very small range in terms of 500 Daltons going up to uh, million or 10 million Daltons as well. So, we will continue in next topic of uh, chromatography in our next class.